Hello everybody, what's up? You're listening to I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon, the podcast that dives into music, film and games, and everything else in between. My guest on this week's episode is Will Jordan, the author of the very popular Ryan Drake series and the creator and presenter of the Critical Drinker YouTube channel, delivering weekly reviews, breakdowns, and analysis on modern entertainment media, which has over 426,000 subscribers and 63 million views so far. We jumped into Will's experience starting out on YouTube as an independent content creator reviewing video games and films, how he literally found his critical voice and his love for the iconic horror survival video game series Resident Evil. So, if you're running, stuck in a traffic jam or sitting behind a desk at work, I hope you enjoy my interview with Will. So when I discovered your channel, The Critical Drinker, um, I was excited by a critical voice that wasn't just singly focused on film, TV and video games. You pretty much reviewed them all. I mean, was that a conscious choice on your part? Most of the time I talk about things that I'm passionate about. You know, one thing I won't do is, is you know, do a video about uh, a movie or a TV show or whatever just because I think it'll get clicks or views. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't really care that much about that kind of thing. I do it more just because... I talk about the things I'm interested in. So if I've played a particular video game and I want to talk about it, I'll make a video. Um, Same with TV shows that I've watched um, and the same thing with movies. So, yeah, it it wasn't really like I was trying to net the biggest audience I could get or Mm -hmm. anything like that. It was more just, um, I guess I've got a broad range of interest when it comes to entertainment. Um, I would even do book reviews, really, if I got right to it. But uh, it's just finding the time, I guess. I just wondered, in terms of sort of like general sort of criticism, do you think it's the future now that critics sort of coming up now are going to have to maybe consider writing or well, writing reviews about film, TV and video games really to have a more informed opinion of what's culturally going on? Because I think one of my examples is like Mark Kermode, like he doesn't really engage with video games yet. A fair amount of the sort of mainstream films yeah. he's watching are inspired by that. Yeah, I mean, I think if you've got someone like him who's obviously, you know, a fair bit older, he's perhaps not going to have that that background in video games that I think is is kind of necessary to to review them. You know, it's not to say that um, he couldn't do it. I just think you kind of have to have been part of that um, mm. that industry or that culture for quite a while to to appreciate them and then to have played a lot of games, so you've got a good point of comparison. Mm. So I think maybe these more established um, movie and and TV show critics, they would uh, they would perhaps struggle to do that kind of thing, um, mm. and I think yeah, it's there's definitely commonalities between video games and uh, and movies that sort of thing. You know, ultimately most games are telling some kind of story. It's just the nature of it is a lot more interactive, and mm-hmm. usually you can influence it a lot more. Um, so it's it's games are definitely for me the harder thing to review right. because there's so much more to them than mm-hmm. than you would get within a um within just a movie which is a passive experience yeah. um but it's all it's all a good challenge you know um it's uh, it's something i enjoy doing i mean the one thing i was sort of struck about in terms of video games is there's definitely there's definitely like a real tangible sense of mechanics to it like how does the actual game play like how does the controller sit in your hand how the buttons been mapped and how do the actual shooting or walking or interactive mechanics work and how does that actually inform the storytelling whereas like in terms of film i guess the only thing you really kind of have to consider i guess is like sound so like pacing in terms of sort of more technical sort of aspects of i guess cinematography i mean maybe i'm brushing over that a bit too easily but it, it there definitely is an element to video games where it's a lot more uh, tactile in a way yeah, definitely. That, that's why they're hard to review, because you're doing all the things that you would look at with a movie, you know, whereas with a movie, you'd look at the, the CGI or the cinematography with a video game. You'll talk about the graphics, but it's the same idea. You've got all the storytelling elements. You've got the characterization. You've got the plot, um, dialogue, all those sort of things you can talk about. But then, like you say, you have to talk about the mechanics of the gameplay. You know, um, how well does it function? Um, how how well does the game deliver that story to you? What degree of control do you have over it? Um, just how well does the, the um, how, how balanced is the gameplay? Mm-hmm. All of those things. So yeah, it, it results in a, a much broader review, I think, yeah. um, which can sometimes be quite a challenging thing to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I genuinely, you know, I think I'm one of those people that's um, kind of ranks video games up there now mm. with, with, 
movies in terms of like the, the actual quality of the stories they can tell. They, they've come on so far in the last 10, 15 years from from what they started of quite a, uh, you know, a industry that was in its infancy to where it's at now it's it's remarkable but it with that comes all the the expectations that get put on them mm. um the, the need to be like um, socially responsible to to reflect all these different things that people look for nowadays um and you know the, to try and please critics who who kind of a lot of the time just care about activism rather than actual quality gameplay so yeah. they've got their own challenges within that industry and that's something I kind of wanted to jump into with you because you've been very sort of vocal about the modern state of uh, film criticism, especially in 2019. To me, it seems that most mainstream critics have kind of lost their way in the mire of identity politics, virtue signaling and clickbait to stay relevant. I mean, what's your particular take about just being a film critic in 2019? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I've talked a great deal about and it's, it's just a pain in the arse, really, because for me, you know, politics is kind of the death of art mm -hmm. you know you've got to have creative freedom to tell the kind of story that you want to tell and if you're now being told well you know we've you've got to um you've got to give all of these different groups uh, proper representation you've got to treat characters in a certain way based on their gender or their sexuality or whatever it might be you know it, it's like starting a game of chess when you're already in checkmate like mm. you've completely crippled your ability to tell a, an interesting story because you're trying to work within this framework of all these different rules to try and please not just the critics but all the people on social media who will absolutely pillory you if they yeah. think that your movie is stepped out of line and i think it's to the detriment of entertainment the result is you get movies now which are you know, just really safe and predictable mm. and they, they adhere to a formula because they're so terrified of getting criticism for all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's that sort of thing's reflected in the critics as well. And I don't know how many of them actually feel this way mm. and how many of them just they feel like they ought to say these things to appease their audience. But either way, they're they're not looking at the things that are actually relevant. And that's why when you've got people like myself who are just making youtube videos about it you know yeah. this isn't our career or for me in a way it's not mm. my career i'm not dependent upon it and i'm not worried about pleasing people necessarily so mm. it gives me a bit of freedom to just kind of say what i want to say and, and call out movies that i think are just crap basically yeah. so that's what i do and i take great pleasure in doing it <laughs> <laughs> Um, just one of the things as I was sort of preparing for the interview, something that sort of cropped up was the, um, the Joker movie, that the um, victims of the Aurora shooting, which is in 2012, which was related to Dark Knight Rises, this new film directed by Todd Phillips and starring Racking Phoenix about the Joker, which they're saying, well, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know, but they're saying it's a little bit more sympathetic take and there's some similarities between it. So I, I clicked on the article and I read it. And the first thing you read is um, one of the victims says, this is a slap in the face to the people that were shot there. And then as I was sort of trucking through, the point was that they didn't want to cancel the movie. Was It was like they wanted Warner Brothers to stop giving political uh, political donations to candidates that supported gun control. And I was like, well, that seems like a fair enough sort of like point, but it was definitely wrapped around somebody's agenda of, oh, Joker movie, bad. But it even sort of misrepresented the um, the people's, uh, the, the victims' sort of like letter of it, which I thought was such a weird... It was such a weird angle to go at something like that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you, you can't have anything but sympathy for, for victims of a tragedy mm. like that, clearly. But, you know, to then have people who are trying to use that kind of suffering for, for some kind of political aim is, mm. is awful, really. It's kind of reprehensible. But then, yeah. you know, if you were to follow that kind of logic, then, you know, films like schindler's list never would have got made because mm. it's almost like well that's that's going to inspire people to be nazis or whatever yeah. you know or you know anything that deals with with unpleasant subjects it's um it leaves you in a, a bit of an impossible situation then because it's almost mm. like saying you, you can't have movies that deal with any kind of violence or yeah. you know terrorism or or any kind of political element of it so where can you go from there? So I, I think, again, you know, it's certainly not to downplay things like that shooting, but, um, you know, this this new Joker movie is dealing with a comic book character who's mm. been around since long before I was born. Um, and 
it's a character that people find interesting mm. and you know they, they want to see where he came from perhaps and by all accounts it does a really good job of that so I, I it would be better to to some extent if people are able to separate that kind mm. of art from yeah. from any kind of political considerations because it's not what it's meant to represent yeah i really agree and it, what's strange to me is that sort of like jumping sort of segueing across even someone like robert downing jr i was just thinking about his particular uh, personal history of if he did this if he behaved or had the similar sort of issues as he did back then i don't know 10 years later if he'd be cast as um iron man purely on his own on his, on his rather um colorful um personal life shall we say and it's the fact that we kind of expect that everybody's going to be sort of like nice they're not going to have any issues always going to say and do the right things and not have any issues which i find very weird because that's the thing that kind of creates character that's the thing that you know struggle and adversity these are the things that we find most interesting yet we're kind of cutting ourselves off the knee by saying well only nice people can can have and, and make things i think in a way yeah i think it's that that whole element that we have nowadays of like going back into people's pasts whether it's like digging up a tweet that they made 10 years ago or something like that and you know holding it against them now mm. um or, or just looking at their their past you know history um like you say those kinds of um, people the people who are perhaps um, a little bit unbalanced or, or that don't just live regular lives often turn out to be the ones who are the most creative who produce mm. the most groundbreaking arts or, or the best performances or whatever it might be um sometimes it requires that i don't know what what do they call it like the kind of tortured artist yeah uh, mentality uh, maybe that's what it is but the, mm. you know like you say there's this expectation now that people need to be like uh, almost flawlessly virtuous all the time and mm. have never put a foot wrong um, and the result is perhaps that we're going to lose those actors or those um, those celebrities or those artists who are the most interesting because they're deemed unacceptable. Mm. Um, and that's going to be a sad thing, I think, for a lot of us, if, if that's what happens. You know, you, you see it, I guess, in some movies nowadays where, you know, you might be watching it and you think, God, this, this lead is just kind of bland and it's yeah. not, he's not, he or she's not making any real impression on me. It's because that person's just not very interesting and mm. it carries over into their performance. Whereas, you know, you get someone like Robert Downey Jr. He's battled his demons. He's had tough times in life, but then it's kind of reflected in who he is now. Yeah, He's a guy who, who's very much seems like he's been there and done that. And mm. I think that played quite well for someone like Tony Stark. <laughs> it did indeed. And I think also just so following off that point, like art has always been like the... It's always been a place where, like, the misfits, the people that didn't really quite fit in or they couldn't fit in anywhere else or could, maybe couldn't quite handle having, like, a nine-to-five job, but they had these other sort of, like, skills. They weren't exactly... Um, you couldn't really put them on, like, a sort of CV or they weren't anything you could particularly sort of, like, teach, but this is where they sort of gravitated towards these... Uh, and I think by making it more more formal, more sort of, like, neutered, you also cutting off a section of, of people to sort of exist and actually have like um, make a career, actually be able to ability to sort of make money in some in some ways, which seems really, yeah, it seems really odd to me. Yeah, I, I think there's um, there, there there's this kind of element now, I suppose, of um, you know actors or, or artists or whatever maybe don't develop as organically as they used to mm. uh, because of you know the expectations that are put on them now like you say that you know it used to be that you'd get those people who weren't that well adjusted the, the misfits who wouldn't be able to do regular jobs like like we do um but that's where they shine you know mm. so i just wanted to sort of jump in to um the critical drinker channel i was just wondering when you were starting to think about making youtube content did you take inspiration from channels like red letter media zero punctuation i believe like oliver harper i think he started a few years before you did as well he did sort of retrospectives as well i first started doing youtube years and years ago just just tinkering around with it mostly because i was interested in, in video editing and, mm. and learning a bit more about that and you know it, it didn't really go very far because i wasn't putting much effort in um and then i eventually left it alone for a good few years mm. and I pursued a writing career instead that took up most of my time but i decided to come back to it just out again out of interest and and Mm. kind of boredom um to some extent and i was i was keen to have another go at it um, and what i did initially was not so much the critical drinker type things but um just a, a kind of 
generic, polite sort of, um, you know, YouTuber who was yeah. talking about video games for the most part. And it didn't really, you know, not really getting any traction. I was getting like a few hundred hits per video. Yeah. And there's nothing there. But then I almost just put one out with an attitude of like, I don't really give a fuck anymore. Mm. I'm just going to just do whatever I, I think and I'm going to say whatever I want to say. Yeah. Um, and I did the, the drinker voice and stuff because I quite like the idea of this character who's kind of articulate and intelligent, mm. but just a drunken asshole at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah. And for some reason, that video just took off. And before I knew it, it had over a million views. And suddenly I had this, um, you know, this pretty rapidly growing channel. Mm. Um, and it felt a little bit like, you know, going on to open mic night with one good joke that landed well and then suddenly right. everyone expects a whole set from you and it's like oh shit now i need to do more videos like this yeah uh, so the, it, yeah the the drinker character i guess and the drinker channel um didn't come straight away but then when it arrived i sort of got immediately why people seemed to appreciate it mm. and i was like oh cool i'm happy to do this because um i, I quite like that character i like the idea of playing a bit of a character rather than just a boring old voice just analyzing stuff so yeah. it just went from there and it's been great um in terms of like the critical drink and the voice because i was there's something i was sort of interested about is like this it sounds this guy sounds really really pissed yet he's very um articulate and has a very um forensic um approach to criticism that you'd only really get if you were an author like yourself that had spent hours and hours and hours really sort of like dissecting the, um, the mechanics of character um narrative and overarching themes was actually based on just living in Scotland and just the regular sort of winos you'd sort of run into or was that something you've been working on for a while? I, I think it was, you know, it was definitely based on experiences where you do sometimes find that people become surprisingly like eloquent and philosophical when they're pissed. Mm. Uh, you know, b before they get over that apex and then they just become incoherent messes. But like, yeah, you can sometimes get that, that perfect level of drunkenness, you know, where you're mm. actually really smart and articulate when you weren't... <laughs> Um, so, uh, and I like, I really like contrasts in mm. characters and people and stuff. So I love that contrast of like, you know, being pissed and coming out with like, you know, really inappropriate humor at times and stuff, but also actually being quite, um, analytical and smart mm. beneath it uh, to something well, as best as I can be anyway. Um, and it allows you to get points across really effectively because people listen to you when they're amused and they're entertained, mm. you know, I, I could yeah. do the same things that I do. Um, with the drinker but if I just spoke in a normal way and I didn't crack jokes or anything and people would be you know falling asleep with it mm. so having a, a bit of an entertainment factor and finding something that people enjoy it allows you to get so much across to them and people take it in because they're interested in you and also I think it's the fact that it's a sort of very I mean this character I want to say is like impervious to bleach because there's references to drinking bleach being fine the next morning drinking vast <laughs> yeah. quantities of, of of alcohol it's sort of a sort of devil may cry aspect to it which which I guess people like because it's sort of like there's a bit of a dig but anybody who works for say IndieWire or the more traditional film publications they are very sort of like clean cut on message almost like politicians where I guess like he's a complete um, sort of uh, antithesis of that so many of these kind of professional um, critics and so on they're so worried about their image or not offending people or whatever that you know much like with what we were discussing earlier mm. they end up becoming completely bland and uninteresting mm. and you know doing that thing of like talking for ages but not really saying anything useful mm. and uh, yeah i just i want you to be the complete opposite of that and i think maybe a lot of us just wish for that you know when we're we're listening to some you know boring arsehole at work mm. giving us a PC lecture or whatever. There's there's that part in all of us, I think, who just wants to go like, oh, fuck off. I'm not interested in what you have to say. But, you know, we can't do it. Yeah, yeah. It gives me an opportunity to just say all these things that perhaps a lot of people are thinking. Mm. So uh, that I just really love. It's cathartic. And it kind of reminds me, because I used to listen to Brett East Analysis, um podcast back when it was on iTunes and it was free. And he had a very... I want to say sort of a contrarian view because he was always talking about uh, empire and post-empire and a lot of sort of identity politics, which I really, I vibed with in a way that I wasn't 100%, I didn't 100% grasp like identity politics and I still really don't, but there was just certain things that sort of like rank me. I think 
the way that's being sort of like positioned and I'm told that I'm supposed to, I'm, this is supposed to be good for me. I'm, this is, I'm supposed to support this book because it represents something. And here was, here was someone like Brittany Sellers and yourself is kind of saying, well, hang on a minute. No, if you look a bit deeper into this, kind of what they're saying isn't, isn't really that much benefit um, of how they're going about it because obviously um, diversity is a great thing um, empowering uh, female characters are great things but I guess it's just how they're kind of going about it for some reason was always sort of like rankling I wasn't 100% sure um, why that was but it's nice someone like you can kind of put that into some context and sort of um, perspective you know talking about all of those things like you say you know I've I've spoken to, to quite a few content creators on YouTube now as part of my channel and mm. you know we all seem to be of like mind in the sense that if you want to have diverse casts if you want to have strong female characters um uh, whatever it might be that's perfectly fine like nobody has an issue with that um what we have an issue with is bad writing mm. um and when you take those things which are noble goals and you implement it in a really clumsy awkward forceful way um you just you alienate people straight away um, and that's why, you know, probably I had uh, an issue with a movie like, say, Captain Marvel, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, you, you've got theoretically a strong female character who's just completely unlikable because she's like Superman without the kryptonite, yeah. you know, completely invincible, completely unstoppable. Nothing can challenge this character. And she doesn't even have a flawed personality to go with it. She's not wrestling with demons or um she's got some kind of personal obstacle to overcome mm. something like that like which might have been interesting if she yeah. you know potentially was a bit of an anti-hero or something but she's just nice and virtuous and strong and capable and all the rest and it's so dull you mm. know we I, I kind of think that people like characters for their flaws not their virtues yeah you know that's why people can warm to someone like tony stark who's just a selfish asshole mm. uh, to begin with, um, who who's kind of just um, out for his own glory and and um, not particularly interested in helping people. But then he strives to be something better over the course of his character arc, yeah. and that's what people like. Whereas if you've got a character who starts off virtuous and great and 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 uh, selfless, where have you got to go from there? Nowhere. So people people don't like it because there's no flaws there to humanize them. The ca- she's, um, Captain Marvel slowly becomes a bigger and bigger arsehole. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, by the end I was, of it, I was on yeah. the podcast uh, when we were talking about this kind of thing, and it's like, God, wouldn't it be interesting if they turned her into a Daenerys from Game of Thrones and yeah. she just goes batshit crazy and starts <laughs> like incinerating cities and stuff? And they have to fight her. She becomes like the next Thanos. Mm. It's like, oh, okay, that could actually be interesting. Yeah. Uh, same with same with someone like Rey from the the new Star Wars movies. Like if she genuinely turned evil and she mm. became the villain i'd be like oh okay well maybe that explains why she's so bloody amazing at everything it's like they were building up to a, a an evil turn yeah um, you won't do that obviously that would involve creativity and, and <laughs> imagination i like you when i went to see the um star wars the last jedi and the more i kind of think about it because when i actually watched the, the film i guess like i wasn't that engaged with sort of star wars i mean i went to see the um the force awakens but the more and more i thought about that movie the more and more i thought wow like I, I don't know, it's almost beyond words. How, how did you get away with it? Yeah, I mean, I, I've talked about this to, mm. to various people and thinking about The Last Jedi is like dealing with uh, a, a monster from H.P. Lovecraft. Like, mm. it, the more you think about it, the closer to insanity you get because it's just mind-boggling, the the things that, that came about to make that movie happen. You know, the fact that he was able to <clears throat> submit a script where the hero of the the original trilogy is portrayed as a grumpy, broken, pathetic old man, Mm. you know, where, where you've got um, every female character is amazing and competent and flawless. And pretty much every male character is whiny or emotionally unstable or Mm. incompetent or idiotic or whatever, you know, a movie that completely breaks the lore of the series and, and, does all kinds of nonsense with like the technology and the science of mm. Star Wars, you know, that nobody would have said, like, mate, this is a great script and all that, but I think there's a few things you're going to have to change here. <laughs> Otherwise, people are going to have lots of questions about it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. I, I can only assume perhaps that um, the, the people at Disney, like Kathleen Kennedy, who mm. was the sort of 
sorry, the president of Lucasfilm, brought him in because he would be pliable and easy to to kind of control. Yeah. Whereas you've got other more experienced directors who are probably going to push back on a lot of things. Whereas someone like him is just going to say yes to everything because he's just just cutting his teeth as a director. He's really just starting out. Yeah. Maybe that was the reason. Um, but yeah, like you, the problems of that movie are more than I could cover in a day. Of, of constant ranting about it it's just insane i mean i was just thinking i played like a little thought experiment so i can't think of another actor that played such an iconic character that years 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 later came back signed up to a movie which essentially was his massive massive comeback for him and they just completely destroyed both the actor and the character and you can visibly see mark hamill almost in tears as he's doing the the press for this movie because it was just like a knife to his heart, yeah. the fact they just completely destroyed his legacy in a way and treated him so, so poorly. The way I understand it is that he signed up to come back to, to Star Wars back when George Lucas was still in control of Lucasfilm. Mm. <clears throat> Ultimately, Lucas then sold it to Disney and Mark Hamill kind of went with them as part of that that deal. So he'd, be, he'd come back on the basis that he'd been sort of talking to George Lucas mm. with an idea for, for how his return would work. And I imagine it was a much more heroic Luke Skywalker. Mm. Um, so probably he was up for that. Um, and then all of a sudden he gets presented with this monstrosity that he's going to have to do. And I just, yeah, I felt so sorry for the guy when he's mm. drinking that green milk. And, mm. you know, it, it's so humiliating. And I think, honestly, if it had been me, I pretty much would have just refused to do it. Mm. Uh, I would have honestly just said, look, if you if you have to sue me for breach of contract on this one, mm. go ahead. I will tell everyone what you're planning to do with this character. Um, yeah. And, you know, at this point in my life and career, I don't need this. I'm not that desperate for work that mm. I'm going to put myself through this because it was just, yeah, it was awful. And like you say, there, there's there's video footage of him like it, uh, after the premiere where he just looks like a man who's seen hell. He gets a bad rap of Mark Hamill because I was listening to an interview with him in sort of Kevin Smith and he was like a really legit sort of theatre actor. I think he even went to sort of like Juilliard. So he gets a bad rap for being sort of, I mean, he wasn't, okay, so the original Star Wars, he wasn't that good, but he, he did find his footing and he's carved a very sort of successful career for himself as a voice actor and stuff. So I think it is, it's un, I think it's a little unfair that people don't appreciate just quite how successful Mark Hamill has been in his career as well. I think so. And, you know, he, you know, he was very young when he did the original movie. And by the time he got to the third one, he'd, he'd grown quite a bit as an actor and a person. And I think he, he did bring a lot more kind of gravitas to the role mm. than he had originally. So I think he's a bit, he gets a bit of unfair criticism. And the one thing I will say about the guy is, fuck me, he's professional. Mm. Because as much as he had absolute shite to work with on The Last Jedi, he yeah. really gave it his all. Like he mm. acted the hell out of that part with as much as he could. And it, it speaks well of his, his kind of professionalism that even though he knew the nonsense he was involved in, he still cared enough about that character to give it his best. And it's like, well, good on him, I suppose. Uh, I, I just wish he hadn't been forced to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Also, I just wanted to just sort of jumping off from that sort of point, I just wanted to sort of jump a little bit into the idea of, into the idea of sort of diversity um, within the film industry. And what sort of like, sort of interest to me is things like Ghostbusters 2016, Captain Marvel to some extent. And I want to say they, they're they talking about casting uh, female Gandalf, the new Lord of the Rings series. And what was interesting about that is the idea of that through diversity or rebalancing the equation, they're taking established properties which have been male-led and then they're then taking those parts away from traditional, I guess, like leading men um, characters and giving them to women, rather than empowering the next generation of filmmakers, storytellers and sort of craftspeople to actually create their own stories that are perhaps more um, reflective and progressive in the times that we kind of live in, which is such an odd, it seems very odd to do in a way. I, I, for me, it's, it's actually unbelievably patronising to, to women, I guess, or, mm. or any minority really that's, uh, that's getting caught up in this, because it's like saying, well... You know, we know you can't make it by yourself, and you're not going to be able to come up with good characters of your own. So mm. we're just gonna we're gonna give you a character. We'll just take one that was 
um, played by a man or a white person or whatever, and we'll give it to you, and it's yours now. It's 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 patronising to them because mm. it's like implying that they can't come up with like original, interesting characters of their own. Um, you know, another example, I guess, would be um, the James Bond issue where they yeah. they're talking. Um, oh, you know, the next maybe the next Bond should be a woman. It's like, well, no, like the mm. character is a male like that as as annoying as that might be for people like that's what he is that's yeah. the way he was written in the books and that's mm. the way he's he's been portrayed in the films like you can't just suddenly decide that a character has gone from male to female mm. without any explanation um and yeah like a lot of the time it becomes it's incompatible with what you're trying to do yeah you know if you were to take bond um and turn him into a female um you're not going to you're not going to be able to play off the same things yeah, that you yeah, do yeah. with the male character so it's 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 a really it's a false equivalency i guess um so it just most of the time it doesn't work and it's unfair i think to everyone it's patronizing to the people who get rebalanced into those roles and yeah. it's really unfair to the people who get roles taken away from them because someone's decided this character needs to be such and such you know yeah um so it's 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 not it's not something I support at all. I'm very much in favour of having diverse um, casts of characters and, and actors, but let it happen properly. Let mm. you come up with characters who are meant to be that way. I think most people probably are, are have got similar opinions. Not that many people seem to be enthusiastic about these um, race and gender swaps of characters. How can ever really truly be diverse if even if you're taking someone from from minority, but you're still sort of like ferrying through through this sort of like system because at the end they're all going to pretty much turn out the same same in a way it doesn't really matter um where they sort of started from but once they go through this sort of like process and they've been sort of like managed and it just seems they're all heading into this form of, sort of homogenization of fitting this particular mold which i guess is like it is also an issue um as well as much as they do try and strive for sort of diversity it's never going to be truly diverse if you keep on ferrying them through this particular i don't know system yeah i, I think it becomes um you're almost trying to engineer mm. um, something that should happen a little bit more naturally. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah, like you say, it, it ends up coming across as fake. And I think people get a sense of when it's been done. Mm. You know, and and when, you, when you start to see the strings that are being pulled in order to make a movie look a certain way or, or feel a certain way, <clears throat> it takes you out of the experience. So yeah. it, it results in, in a movie or a TV show, whatever it might be, that you can't get into because you just see, oh, I can tell why they've done that or I can tell why they've, they've put this person in here. Yeah. Um, it leeches all the fun out of it, really. So, yeah, I don't, I don't understand how it's, how it's meant to work like that, mm. you know. I mean, speaking of things of that sort of like nature, so I was... Um... I was rather amused to find out that Game of Thrones season eight had won the Outstanding Drama Series at the 2019 Emmy Awards. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it kind of made me question, like, do award shows mean anything really outside of selling more movie tickets and boosting ratings for really popular TV shows? Yeah, again, like Game of Thrones, <clears throat> excuse me, was one of those shows that um, certainly for me, I was always taken in by it because I always had the feeling of like, this show is smarter than the mm. people watching it. it. It's got a plan. Um, it's building up to something incredible. There's there's all these hidden meanings to, to so much, like, you know, the cycle of the, 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 the unusual winters and the, the coming of the um, the White Walkers and all that sort of thing. This all means something, and they're going to explain it, and it's going to be mind-blowing. And then you get right down to it, and it's nothing. Like, mm. And then you realize holy shit, like these guys had nothing going on this whole time. They didn't have a, a plan. Yeah, They didn't know what they were building up to. The, this show wasn't anywhere near as smart as I thought it was going to be. And again, it, it's that thing of like, okay, I, I can totally see the strings being pulled now. Yeah. And it's taken right out of the experience. And it's such a shame because it was such a great show when it was at its peak. Mm. Um, and it was, yeah, I... It, uh, it let a lot of people down, clearly. And I think, going back to your point about the awards that it gets, it's just another example of how, you know, things like the Emmys, the Oscars, all that sort of thing, it is just these people slapping each other on the back. Mm. Uh, and it's just them self-congratulating 
um, and and probably doing a good bit of virtue signaling at the same time, um, rather than any kind of objective analysis of quality mm. um, and good storytelling. Um, and again, it's it's probably something that uh, a lot of people are waking up to now because it's so blatant. Yeah, you know when you can show that's failed as badly as Game of Thrones getting getting awards like that, you're just like, yeah, this this means nothing now. <laughs> it really doesn't. It kind of reminds me of like it being the world's most expensive and biggest office party, and it's rigged, <clears throat> and then all the yeah. all the sort of star performers go out there and have a good old time. And I mean, I should just say like I so saw a few years ago, I did go to the Baftas, I went to the film Baftas, and I had a pretty good time. Like the pageantry is kind of nice, and I got to speak to the makers of uh, this small indie movie um called uh, lady Macbeth, and to be you know I had, a, I had a pretty good time but i i guess it's difficult because if you really are into sort of like film history and you think of the oscars or the emmys and stuff you're like well i wouldn't mind going to that purely for the sort of pageantry but as for any uh it, it sort of being any sort of judgment on the idea of like quality when's the last time anything has sort of mattered like that i, I don't know yeah i mean I, I think up until about 10 years ago maybe even five actually mm. like the oscars still meant something you know it was yeah. to to have a movie that was <clears throat> nominated for an oscar um never mind winning was an incredible honor for any filmmaker i guess yeah but now you know the, the now that they have become so overtly political in the oscars and like every bloody person who gets up there has something to say about the orange man or whatever um you know <laughs> It, it absolutely kills it. And then yeah. you realise it's just people massaging their own egos. That's mm. all it's become. Um, and, and Hollywood trying to demonstrate how like non-racist and non-sexist it is and how amazing they all are. Um, and that's probably reflected in the fact that viewing figures are now in the toilet. Yeah, You know, less and less people are watching the Oscars every single year because they can kind of see them for what they are. Mm. Um, and people... People don't tune in to watch actors talk about politics. Just because you're famous, just because you're, um, you know, you're widely known and stuff, doesn't mean you're in any way qualified to have opinions about the current state of world politics. Like, you're just most of the time, you're just as clueless as every other person on the street. You're just better dressed. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that they they need to realise because, yeah, I think they've lost that sense of reality, I suppose. And things like social media just give them this inflated sense that they, they are somehow knowledgeable mm. when they're not most of the time. So just jumping back to Brie Larson, I just wonder if she'll have a look back at about her comments she made about wrinkle in time and about white male critics and, and, and sort of excluding people from having a an opinion on something. I just wonder, you know, if the tides were to sort of like change, I mean, how quickly these people's affiliations or, or views would sort of like change with sort of like current trends. And I mean, I, d I can't remember a time when it was like where actors were, could be so divisive in terms of which alliances they kind of had. They always seemed to be a bit apolitical, but now I'm thinking of Redford and Marlon Brando. I, I think probably because in the past, the questions were asked less of them. They were asked less about their political opinions mm. now. Whereas in 2019, every single thing you do is political. Mm. You know, you pour semi-skimmed milk on your cornflakes in the morning. That's a political <laughs> act, as, for, as far as some people are concerned. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's just too much. But mm. then the, the act of not being political for a lot of people is a choice as well. Like, yeah. uh, I think Taylor Swift has consciously stayed away from politics for years because mm. she knew, as much as anyone does, the moment you come down on one side or the other everyone on the opposite side is going to automatically hit you. And then yeah. suddenly you don't make as much money. Um, but then the more you try and resist it, the more people are going to press you on it because again, they just, they've got this insane need to know what your political views are on everything. And it's mm. just like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't subject actors to that kind of thing and they shouldn't court it because yeah. I can't remember who said it, but they basically said, look, actors are pretty much the court jesters of the modern world. They're there to make us laugh and mm -hmm. entertain us. Yeah. Not there to have opinions about things. Like but they've they've been forced into that role and some of them have forced their way into that role, I guess. So yeah, I think Brie Larson's probably gonna look back on some of those comments she made and really regret them because they come back to bite her so often. Well, I also think it's like the erosion of sort of star power, because I was just making a little mental list of leading male actors that, that had the sort of star power i mean i know it's a different world but it kind of had the star power of like tom cruise that they could open any any movie it didn't matter what the movie was as long as they were in there and 
I mean, they tried, I guess, sort of with Taylor Kitsch, I want to say, with like uh, the Battleship movie, um, John Carter of Mars, Jai Courtney's had a few goes, Zac Efron, but there's nothing that's really sort of stuck. So I guess in terms of relevance and where they sit with the culture, the more that you can align yourself with more... In a weird way, it seems like politics is, um, and that sort of discourse seems more culturally impactful, more relevant, I guess, with the memification of it than movies in some regards, in terms of that being like the... The fo- the focus, I mean, in itself, politics, I mean, has become a sense of sort of um, entertainment in a way. No, you, you, <clears throat> you've got essentially the situation where a reality TV star who's a kind of entertainer is now the, the president of the United States. And the, the way politics is conducted now, it's, <clears throat> it's almost theatrical mm. or pantomime-like in the way people, politicians insult each other. You know, they, they don't act like public servants anymore. They act like actors in a play with the good guys and the bad guys always trying to get one over on each other and yeah that's i guess that that's like a weird merging Mm. of two worlds like you're saying you know as entertainment is becoming more political politics is becoming more like entertainment they're not really two worlds that should meet (laughs) you know what i mean it was like really boring done by people who are really serious about Mm. what they do than what we have at the moment but that's the world we live in unfortunately you know on my channel i I obviously don't really get into politics in a larger sense i just talk about uh the sort of merging of that with entertainment and how it can how it can affect the the quality of the products that you're putting out so i just kind of wanted to jump into steering away from uh, politics for a moment um i just wanted to jump into your love for the resident evil games because i watched your retrospective on them uh, oh yeah yeah um, which I really enjoyed. It was so the first Resident Evil game that I played was um, Resident Evil Five. So my appreciation and experience of the series is like very, very different from yours, I guess, from playing the original Resident Evil. And I, I just wondered, do you think your opinion kind of would have been a bit different if you played Resident Evil Four first? I think everyone's got fond memories of their, you know, their first game in a series or whatever, because that's mm. their that becomes their standard of measure, and that's the that's the way they relate to that series. So, yeah, much like for yourself, like you would have uh, played Resident Evil Five. That's a very action oriented game, um, and that's why that's perhaps how you would view the series. But then you go mm. back to the the early ones, and they're they're much slower paced, and they're much more based around um, and kind of exploration and, and uh, resource management, all that sort of thing. Um, but that, I guess, is what kind of appealed to me when I first started playing yeah. it. Like, I, I really kicked off with the very first one, like, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I just absolutely loved it. Like, I played the shit out of that game. And, and so most of the other um, PlayStation era ones. And I just really I found them really enjoyable. And I guess I always wanted to talk about my experiences of playing them. And yeah. my thoughts on how they gradually <clears throat> change over the years how the series has gone through different phases and you know now it's kind of gone full circle it's back to resident evil 7 which is that much more that slower paced yeah. you know constrained um sort of puzzle solving based uh, experience so it's gone all the way back to what it started with um and i think resident evil revelations 2 is another one like that yeah. much much more constrained low-key based around the the sort of horror aspects of it more but i've all i've enjoyed all of them in their own ways like even even six which is kind of like yeah. seen as a bit of a low point uh, i can go back to it and play it and it's like oh it's a good action game it's fun it's not really a resident evil game like i remember but yeah. it's still a good game to play it's good good laugh because i just remember playing resident evil 5 with my brother on co-op and we would just play the uh Oh god, I'm trying to remember what it was. The basically the, the um it's like the multiplayer where you go around and just shoot zombies for points and stuff and it's yeah, time. Like kind of yeah, and we yeah, would just uh, fucking play that till we got like was it S class? I think that's yeah. Probably... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it was good to... Yeah, I liked five actually. Like um it's uh in the main campaign mode I think the 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 two player thing felt a little bit tacked mm. on and when I played it most of the time I was just doing it in single player mode, right. so the, 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 your companion was an AI and not a particularly good one no. um, and I always felt like a Resident Evil game should be a solo kind of experience right. should be you versus the environment and it makes you feel you know, a lot more vulnerable because you don't have someone watching your back or giving you extra firepower or whatever it might be um, but that's just me that's the, way I, that's the way I took it 
I think uh, in the main campaign mode, me and my brother played it, and that you could go around collecting treasure for guns, I think. So it's a case yeah. of him. He's, be- he's a much better video game player than I am, and he's younger than I am as well. So it's doubly, doubly insulting. You just go up and run and nick all the treasure. Um, yeah. <laughs> See, in the original game, I like the fact that mm. you could quite conceivably run out of ammunition. If you if you play fast and loose with, with your guns and you try and take out every enemy, you'll just run out of bullets, and yeah. then you're screwed. Like, there's no more to be found, and then that's it. You pretty much would have to restart the game. Mm. Uh, so it's pretty unforgiving back then, I think. But I was just sort of thinking in terms of... Because I watched your... Um your uh, Tomb Raider video as well about comparing the two different versions of, uh, well, the the 90s version of Lara Croft versus this sort of Ortiz reboot, and which was actually originally yeah. written by Terry Pratchett's daughter, who's quite a, a well-renowned game writer as well in her own right. And I just wondered, did you have a pitch slash treatment for a Tomb Raider film that was tucked away in your desk drawer somewhere? No, no, not at all. Um, you know, I was just analysing it purely from the point of view of the gaming experience that you get <clears throat> from playing it. And the thing that, um, that always struck with me about the original Lara was that there was a great mystique about the character. Mm. Uh, I think I talked about that in my video is that, you know, you only get like little fragments of insight into her her life outside of this game and and her experiences and stuff, but it's enough to keep you interested in her. And yeah, you know, I I don't I don't care about like you know what she was doing when she was eight years old and she was um, you know playing hide and seek with her dad in her big mansion house. Like that's not interesting about the character. Yeah. It takes away from that air of mystery about her. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also like the fact that she's much more independent and and much better at making decisions in the original game yeah you know she's not forced into a situation that she has to kind of escape from and she's not she's not constantly like crying or Mm. or frightened every two minutes about something while simultaneously mowing down dozens (laughs) of people no she's she goes in because she's an adventurer she she willingly you know goes into these tombs to look for artifacts and stuff because that's what she loves doing that's her Mm. lifestyle and i think that's incredibly like compelling about the character it's like oh wow you've got this female character who's just adventurous who just loves doing stuff for the hell of it because she finds it fun um i I think that makes for a much more interesting character than what you end up with in the the new games Mm. uh, where she's always whining she's always scared she's always like moralizing about how she's to blame for everything um it's 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 less interesting for me i guess do you think like a director like Ben Wheatley and Amy Jump, who've just signed up to do the sequel to the, I guess you want to say that like soft reboot or the reboot to um, Tomb Raider that was out a few years ago. I mean, do you think they'll be allowed to take Lara Croft in a different direction? Because my mind was always going, one of the games that she's chasing down like T-Rexes and it gets like a lot more sort of like mythical, which I guess I'd never really sort of successfully uh, succeeded to get the more... Um, fantasy elements of Tomb Raider they've not really sort of backstepped and tried to make it a bit more uh, based in reality where I kind of feel that maybe going the opposite direction might be of some benefit to the series in terms of the films I think you could go either direction with it <clears throat> if it's well written then you could probably make either one work Yeah. Um, the, the sort of Angelina Jolie movies were based around that more um, fantastical element there was magic, there was time travel and mm. stuff in it and it worked fine for what it was. Like um, it was obviously kind of tongue in cheek and a bit campy, mm. um, but I guess that's that's an element of what made Tomb Raider interesting as a yeah. game. Is it's one of those ones I don't necessarily think it's ever going to translate that well into a movie. Right. Like Alicia Vikander, um, who plays Lara now, um, you know she was perfectly adequate in the role, mm. but she kind of felt like she'd taken a back seat in her own movie. Yeah. Like, um, she's just kind of there and she gets kind of dragged along for most of the plot um, whereas I feel like Lara should be a lot more proactive and mm. uh, again it puts her into that situation where she's just she's trapped and she's got to fight her way out of it rather than willingly going forward and, and looking for clues and, and doing the things that are actually involved in Tomb Raider so I, I, I'm really surprised they're even doing a second movie Me if I'm too. honest because yeah. It wasn't that much of a success, as far as I know. Um, so I don't know how much of an appetite there is for another one. But, well, who knows? Maybe they'll do something interesting with it. So I just wanted to kind of just jump into your own experience of 
having your own work adapted to the to the screen because I know you sold the film rights to your first novel Redemption a few years ago um I just wondered yes. what the how the development process is going so far and having just watched your video on the adaptation of Clan of the Cave Bear I just wondered if you had any um concerns yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean to be honest like yeah when you sign it over you you basically you know give up that control over it and it becomes not yours anymore it's someone else's interpretation of your work so you know that's fair enough I think you have to be at peace with that before you even do it otherwise don't sign the rights over mm. um but in terms of the actual process of adapting it to the screen it's just long it, it takes a long time um you know the, uh, a lot of people um they'll production companies will buy up the rights to a book and then just sit on them for decades yeah. because they can it's just to make sure they've got it and just in case that book ever becomes like a, a mega hit They've mm. got the film rights to it, um, and you know, in my case, they are they've been actively developing it for a couple of years. Um, they got a script written. Um, they are trying to pull like, together this sort of international financing to make it work right. um, because it's not like you know, it's not like Universal Studios has bought this or anything. It's a mm. much smaller kind of production company, um, but it's. You know this movie. If to make it, it's going to need a fairly hefty budget because it's an international thriller. There's action scenes. There's going to be all kinds of you know, um, you know location shots they would have to do in the desert, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and that costs money. So the the, may, the way they have to make it work is to get partners to agree to it um, and to to invest in the movie, um, and then get you know a shooting schedule that allows everyone to to get their monies back and all that sort of thing and yeah. get actors attached to it who are going to draw in enough money to make the thing viable. So it's like this huge web of, of or this huge collection of plates that have got to be constantly spinning mm. um, at the same time. And they've all got to be um, lined up uh, at that perfect moment to make it all work. So um, I think they've got quite a few of the plates spinning. Right. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's I, for the most part, I'm like, yeah, just, you know, give me a call when it goes into production and then write me a check. <laughs> <laughs> so did they, um, so they, did he send you like a draft of the sort of script for you to look over and did they, were they interested in having you give a few notes? Yeah, I mean, they were, they were interested in my, because um, uh, as far as my contract goes, I've got a degree of creative input. That's mm -hmm. what it says. So it pretty much means I can make suggestions, but they can totally ignore them if yeah. they don't like them. So, um, most of the time, um, it'll just be, you know, they'd come to me and say, like, you know, give me a good description of what this character is like. Right. Who do you think would be good to play them? What sort of person do you think they are? And, you know, I'll write them out notes and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and I've seen uh, an earlier draft of the script, right. which was surprisingly close, actually, to the um, to the book. Mm. Um, it updated some of the things because the book's set um, about 10 years ago. Right. So. They've updated certain things to make it more uh, relevant. But, yeah, most of the things they've actually managed to keep in, so I was quite surprised. Um, whether that's the, the final version, I don't know. Um, but it is quite cool to see someone else's interpretation of your your work. I mean, did you not fancy um, possibly in the future writing screenplays yourself? Because I know it's a very different medium mm. from writing a novel. It definitely is about economy, and it's almost a sense of almost, I don't know, minimalism on the page you just don't have you know this lovely sort of like flowing sentences and paragraphs and, and description and in screenplays is that something that's ever sort of caught your imagination as something you might want to do it does appeal to me um like you say it's a different process and you've got to be much more economical to go from like a 500 page book down to a 90 or 100 page screenplay is no easy task but to still <clears throat> tell the same sort of kind of story um you know, when I write my books, I mm -hmm. kind of imagine the scenes playing out in front of me as if they're a film. So I, I would imagine the angle I'm seeing it from and how the characters are moving around in that scene, how they, they you know, look at each other, their facial expressions, all that kind of thing. So it wouldn't be too far removed from what I do at the moment. And I've had yeah. people come to me actually since, you know, since the YouTube channels take it off and say, like, you know, um, We've got screenplays that we're doing for like, you know, independent movies and stuff. Would you be mm. interested in like reviewing them and polishing them up, that sort right. of thing? And it's like, well, yeah, I'd love to. But like right now, I'm doing my YouTube channel. I'm writing my next novel at the mm -hmm. moment. I've, I work a job um, part time as well. So all of those things, there's, there's just no way I can fit it all in, you know. 
I just was interested, though, in your earliest interviews promoting um, redemption, you spoke about character being the key to a successful, engaging story. And I just kind of wanted to know, growing up in Scotland, who was the kind of like most interesting, complex person you knew? And how did they kind of inform and shape your approach to writing fictional characters late in your life? You know, you meet so many people mm. in your life. There's going to be aspects of people mm. that, you know, whether it's just some interesting little quirk or mm. like a turn of phrase or, or something about them. You're like, oh, you know, that that's really cool. I'd be I'd, I'll work that into a character at some point yeah. um, or have it form the basis of someone. Uh, but it's not like there was a, you know, Ryan Drake's not based on a, a real person that yeah. I know or anything like that. They, you know, these characters come from a completely different mm -hmm. world, I guess. Um, but yeah, the, the critical drinker is more based on people that I've known right. growing up in Scotland because you know, plenty, of, plenty of people like drinking here. So, I mean, what's been the biggest challenge for you transitioning between the literary and YouTube world? And has there been any sort of like backlash from, say, publishers or agents or fans? Yeah, I mean, I think most people recognise that the critical drinker is a character that you play. You know, it's almost like mm. being an actor, you're playing a role. Um, and, you know, for the most part, like, I, I haven't really bothered to, to try and uh, merge those two different worlds, if you mm. know what I mean. Like, yeah. I, I do my writing and I do my YouTube and, and, you know, I don't see them as overlapping particularly right. because they're different things. Um, so I guess it's, it's not really been an issue. Um, the more difficult issue is the kind of creative side of it where, right. you know, I'm writing my books. Um, I have to be in like, you know, super focused kind of serious, um, author mode. Yeah. And then if I want to do a script for a, for a drinker video, I have to completely flip into like, you know, uh, funny, um, you know, irreverent, mm. um, but sort of analytical mode to, to talk about the thing I'm going to do. So it's like yeah. a complete step change in my mind. So I have to kind of compartmentalize my brain a little bit to, to do all these different things. I mean, can you do both in the same day? Because that's something I found tricky when I've been writing sort of more fictional sort of stuff and then going on and actually writing more <laughs> analytical stuff. I find for my brain works that I can probably do one a day. And I just wonder with you, do you sometimes write a drinker script and then have like a, say a few hours spare to, well, not spare, but to write your sort of, um, books as well? Yeah, I did it yesterday. Um, mm. I was working on my book during the day and then um, I decided I was going to do a drinker video in the evening because I was kind of burned out with writing by that right. point. Um, I was like, you know, need to need to do something else. And um, I ended up putting out a video about, um, I think, Kevin Feige moving over to Star Wars. You did, I watched it. Star Wars movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I did that yesterday evening. So it can be done. It's hard, though. Um, mm. And a, little, a beer or two kind of helped me on the, the process to get into drinker mode. I just wondered in terms of there was sort of an Ozzy Osbourne like sort of like pressure for when you actually meet people in, in real life to be <laughs> to be drunk, to be inebriated and hung over um, and most of the time. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think it's, yeah, I was... Uh, you know, it's more of a, an issue when I'm doing things like live streams or just like interviews like I'm doing now where, mm. you know, I'm not reviewing something and I'm not working from a script. Um, clearly, I can't do the drinker voice for like, uh, if I was on a live stream for like four or five hours straight, I would just shred my vocal cords. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, you can't maintain that kind of character for that length of time. So I just have to be honest when I do things like that. It's like, look, I'm out of character at the moment. I'm just going to talk as me. Um but I mean, it's it's fine because, you know, although the drinker obviously is like me times a hundred, mm. like all the opinions that I express when I'm doing those videos are my opinions. They're yeah. just like amped up a little bit. Um, so I would always stand by everything I say um, mm. as that character anyway. So when I do talking about um, movies that I've reviewed in the past or whatever, <clears throat> I'll usually have the same points or the same opinions about them that I've always had. You know, yeah. So it's. I think it's just managing people's understanding of how it works, and I think most people on you know they get it. It's like mm. you can't you can't be in character twenty four seven. That's just not possible. So my final question um, for you was: What's your dream project if money and time uh, wasn't an issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of happening at the moment. Like seeing um, my my books get made into movies mm -hmm. is my sort of ultimate goal. Um, obviously, one's kind of on the way. What I'd love is for that to be successful and then be able to, to you know, convert the rest of them into films. Um, to be able to do that, it would be like the, the kind of biggest achievement, I guess, that I could hope for. So, yeah, yeah that, that would do. I'd be satisfied with that, I would say.
I don't know when you sold the rights, but it definitely seems like there's this golden, well, golden era of TV, which seems to be maybe not becoming so golden at the moment. But is that something that maybe because you've got a long running series, I don't I want to say you are you on book eight now of the Ryan Drake series? Yeah. So eight of them have come out and I'm yeah. working on the, the ninth one, which is the last one. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, TV is another option. You could probably do it. You need a pretty hefty budget just because mm. it's action heavy. But uh, yeah, that would that wouldn't be something I would complain about. I think either way, if you bring it to the screen, yeah. um, <coughs> so few authors get that opportunity. Mm. So even to have gotten to the stage that I'm at it makes me feel you know incredibly lucky. Yeah. So uh, I just uh, kind of happy to to see where it goes. I suppose. So, there you have it. I had a great time chatting with Will. And you can subscribe, like and watch The Critical Drinker on YouTube right now. Just hit the link in the description box below. And don't forget to check out more great content on aruba.com from film reviews, video game hot takes and top 10 videos. And why not sign up and become a member and share your passion for all things entertainment on aruba.com today. And you can like and subscribe to I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube. And maybe leave a comment or a review if you like. And you can support the podcast on Subscribestar at www.subscribestar.com forward slash I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon right now. Thank you so much for listening. I've been Tom and I'll catch up with you next episode.